Hi, I'm Trish Johnson, Director of Forest Conservation for the Nature Conservancy, coming to you from the University of Tennessee's Cumberland Forest. The Nature Conservancy is a nonprofit organization that was started in the 1950s as a grassroots protection conservation organization. We have grown over the past 70 years into one of the world's largest conservation organizations. We have chapters that are all throughout the contiguous U.S. and we also touch down in over 70 countries. The Tennessee chapter does work with various state and federal partners as well as the University of Tennessee. And Kevin made a note earlier that we just signed a historical agreement last fall to join together to develop a working woodlands program on the university's forests. This partnership called Working Woodlands joins together permanent protection of forests, certified forest management plans that are Forest Stewardship Council certified, which is what we consider the gold standard of certification, and also forest carbon. Forest carbon is being traded on regulatory markets as well as voluntary markets. And before I start to discuss what the forest carbon markets are, I would love to turn it over to my colleague, Laura Marks, to describe to you better how to measure forest carbon in trees. Hi, I'm Laura Marks, forest ecologist for the Nature Conservancy. Welcome to Forest Carbon 101. You've probably heard that trees store carbon, but what does that mean? How much carbon is in a tree like this in the forest, or in a tree near your office, or in your yard? And how does the amount of carbon in here compare to the amount of carbon that you emit when you drive your car or use energy for your house? Well, that's what we're about to find out. For the past probably 60 to 90 years, this tree has been sequestering carbon. So it started as a tiny acorn, and for all those years it's been taking carbon dioxide from the air, keeping the carbon and putting it into wood, and releasing the oxygen. We're going to see how much carbon it's stored in that time and then what that means compared to what you might emit in your daily life. So this red oak is tree 39 in plot 2390 in Wells State Park in Massachusetts and foresters have been measuring this tree for the past 50 years. When they first measured the diameter of it they were probably mostly interested in the timber value of this tree but now we've added a new value, carbon. At this point, this red oak is 18 inches in diameter. And because other scientists have done the work of cutting down trees and weighing them, we know that an 18 inch diameter red oak has about 1,600 pounds of carbon in it. That's the equivalent of almost three tons of carbon dioxide. To put that into perspective, when you drive a medium-sized car 2,500 miles, you're releasing a ton of carbon dioxide. So if you have a 50-mile round-trip commute, after 30 weeks, your medium-sized car and the amount of carbon that's in this tree have canceled each other out. And now we're looking at a deficit of carbon dioxide. That deficit is one reason why it's so important for all of us to reduce our emissions use less fossil fuels and make sure that those we do use, we use the most efficiently. But before you get too discouraged, keep in mind that this tree isn't going anywhere. Every year this red oak is sequestering carbon and a tree like this could easily live for 200, 300, or if it's really lucky, 500 years. And then there are lots of trees like this oak in the forest. An acre of forest can sequester more than a ton of carbon dioxide every single year. Imagine all those acres put together, and now imagine an entire rainforest. Forests are one of the best and most efficient ways that we have to take carbon dioxide out of the air and store the carbon. So we have to do our part with reducing emissions, but the more forests like this we have, the more the trees can help us out as well. The Working Woodlands program that we kickstarted in Tennessee in 2015 focuses on large private and public landowners, large meaning about 2,000 acres or more. And the reason why we focus on that size of landowner is because developing, monitoring, and measuring forest carbon projects are very expensive. And in order to receive the revenue from the forest carbon, 
that we need in order to make a project viable and have good revenue for incentivizing the program, we need to have larger private forests and public forests. So we are at about 30,000 acres on four projects. We started on a 3,000 acre project in White County, Tennessee with a private landowner. They have a permanent forest conservation easement. They are certified under Forest Stewardship Council certification. They do sustainable harvesting practices. They manage for invasive species on their forests and they're very excited about the program and the ecological results that they're receiving. We've been able to bring in our experts on caves and karst and help them understand better the really wonderful features that they have on their property. The next program that we started was with Bridgestone Americas. And Bridgestone owned about 6,000 acres, also in White County on the Cumberland Plateau. And we started working with them on Forest Stewardship Council, inventory of their forest. We even started doing restoration of shortleaf pine and other um, native forest types and started the idea of forest carbon markets with them. And a couple of years later, they decided they would prefer to put the ownership permanently protected under the Nature Conservancy. So we're actively managing that project. Um, our other project that we have is in Johnson County, and that one was a privately owned mountain. Um, and that mountain was under development, and 10 years ago when the recession hit, um, the developers stopped the development of that mountain, and the Nature Conservancy was able to go in, purchase the mountain, protect it in perpetuity, and transfer it over to the state, which is now managed by the Doe Mountain Recreation Authority Board. And the Nature Conservancy helped the board get into the forest carbon market so that they could help sustainably manage and bring income into increasing ecotourism in the rural community. And then finally, our fourth project, which brings us up to about 30,000 acres of working woodlands programs in Tennessee, is the historic agreement that we signed with the University of Tennessee. Um, this program is really interesting and innovative because it joins the opportunity to increase research and educational opportunities through our Climate Smart Forestry Fund. And it also creates a platform for the university to bring their students and their classes to help them better understand climate smart forestry practices, help them understand these innovative carbon markets, and just bring some new light to private landowners to help them and encourage them understand that this may be an opportunity for them. So we have these large private and public partnerships with Working Woodlands. And the Nature Conservancy knows that this is just the beginning. And we wanna ensure that small private forest landowners can also engage in forest carbon markets and bring in income to them to help them manage their forests, help them protect their forests. And so the Nature Conservancy started a partnership with American Forest Foundation. We also got gracious funding from larger corporations to kickstart this program to develop the Family Far Forest Program. Family Forest Program is a pilot that is started in Pennsylvania um, and it brings together 20 acre forest landowners up to about 200 acre forest landowners and gives them the opportunity to join in to voluntary forest carbon markets so that they can get added income for their forest, to help them manage more sustainably, to increase forest health, increase forest sequestration, and, and bring a greater opportunity to forest landowners to keep their forests in forests for generations to come. So what is a carbon market? Um, the carbon marketplace was developed quite a while ago in California. And California regulates um, any business or corporation that's operating out of California to, California to cap their emissions. So when they're operating their business, they are putting off emissions or carbon dioxide, carbon monoxides. And there is a cap or a ceiling by which the number of those emissions are allowed to be emitted. And if that corporation goes above that, they are allowed to purchase a carbon credit, which is carbon that's being sequestered into a forest, a wetland, or another technology that is capturing that carbon emission. 
So there is a marketplace by which landowners, organizations are selling carbon capture or carbon credits and then businesses out of California are able to purchase those credits. That is the regulatory market. The voluntary market is one in which there is no regulation for corporations or private individuals to actually buy a carbon credit. So carbon credits are being developed by private landowners such as the University of Tennessee Institute of Ag and the Nature Conservancy with our Working Woodlands program. And corporations are buying it just because they want to make a difference. They want to make a difference in our changing climate and the conditions that our globe is facing. So thank you for having me here today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, the great partnership that we've started with the University of Tennessee to join in on developing um, a forest carbon project, the Working Woodlands Program, and help to share that with landowners and encourage landowners to be a part of the solution of our changing climate.